Whether it's the legendary Lionesses, grassroots or expert analysis of the women's leagues, Women's Football News has it all covered. A brand new monthly magazine packed with news, interviews and expert opinion. Don't miss Women's Football News. Pick up a copy today from participating retailers. Women's Football is here to stay and so are we. Welcome everyone to the Liverpool.com podcast. I'm your host David Comerford and I'm joined as usual by the Liverpool.com editor Matt Addison. And in today's episode, we are going to have a look at the Premier League title race. We are now 10 games into the new season. And this really, in August, is when you say, you know what, we're going to wait 10 games, we're going to judge it then. So we've reached that sort of first checkpoint where we can make our initial assessment on kind of the lay of the land in the Premier League. Liverpool are currently in fourth place. They've picked up 23 points out of a possible 30, which is a strong return, but they still remain three points off the surprise leaders, Tottenham. And then Arsenal and Man City are uh, one point out of them level on 24. So today, we're going to examine Liverpool's title credentials and take a look at those potential rivals. And we will start, obviously, Matt, with the Reds. Um, how much more confident are you about Liverpool's title prospects than you were at the start of the season? I mean, maybe you were really optimistic at the start, but it definitely feels like they've overperformed a little bit relative to what a lot of fans anticipated. Yeah, I mean, you're never quite sure, are you, when a new season starts? I think particularly, obviously, with the, the midfield overhaul that they had, I wasn't quite sure how quickly that would click. I think we knew that Liverpool would be a lot better. I think we knew that there'd be, you know, Diogo Jota being back fit, Luis Diaz as well, obviously. Um, you know, we we saw that their attack would be very, very strong. We thought that to a certain degree they'd be able to probably comfortably get back into the top four. It was then a case of, of could they catch Manchester City? Um, I, I think my my confidence is, is twofold in that I think City are probably not as good as what they were last year. I think they're probably missing a, a couple of players. Ilkay Gundogan, I thought, was always going to be a, a big, big loss for them. That's not to say that they've dropped off loads or they're not going to be the team to beat, but... I think it, it, it's partly that, and it's partly just how much you know Liverpool have, have just hit the ground running. Really, I think they they could quite easily be top of the table at this point, mm. were it not for VAR errors and, and that kind of thing. But you know, it's it, it's been a strong start to the season. I think they're really benefiting from being able to rotate with the cup competitions. I think there's there's a lot to like. I think Liverpool will comfortably be in the top three at the end of this season. It's just a case of, you know, is it third with a bit of a title push or, or is it kind of third and, and they maybe win one or two other trophies and, yeah. and Manchester City run away with it. But we'll see what happens. But I'm a, I'm definitely more confident, but I was reasonably confident in the summer that they'd be certainly a lot better than what they were last year. Yeah, and if we look at the data on this, there's a, um, a model that's been put together by 21st Group they, at the start of the season, put Liverpool's title chances at just 12%. and um, That was level with Arsenal. Man City were on 63%, which is also the likelihood of Liverpool finishing the top four. Now their chances of the top four are up to 89%. So linking in with what you said, Matt, about kind of the, the comfort with which they'll hopefully finish, you know, in that sort of top three, four places. Um, title chances rated at 17%, one ahead of Arsenal now. And cities have come down slightly to, to 59 So not kind of a, a seismic shift, but definitely... Liverpool consolidating their place at the very least in that Champions League picture, which I suppose going into this season was the absolute top priority after obviously dropping out last year. But the dynamics of this race are a bit different to previous years, you'd say, because in those years, obviously City always go in as favourites, but Liverpool have probably been identified as at least the main challenger. This time around, there was a um, big predictions piece that the BBC usually do at the start of the season. They had 27 different pundits. Only one of those pundits, I think, was Shea Given. Um, had Liverpool in the top two, 10 had them in the top three, and six left them out of the top four altogether. And the reason I bring that up is because I wonder if playing without that kind of burden of expectation and, and almost being cast in that underdog role like we saw a bit earlier in Klopp's tenure, whether that kind of suits the side and whether that's been part of the reason they've been able to play with with so much freedom and, and um, enjoy really in the first few weeks of the season. Yeah, I think that definitely plays into it. I think it's it's really interesting whenever we see these pundit predictions. It was the same the season after Liverpool last collapsed a couple of years ago before they went for the quadruple. And I don't know what it is, but people seem to to think that Liverpool will drop off a lot more than, than what they always do. I mean, that, that particular season, they finished third and they had no centre-backs and pretty much everything that could have gone wrong went wrong for them. And they still finished third and then there were still people going, oh, well, they might not make the Champions League, they might not get into the top four. And that always always seemed to, to be unrealistic. I think there was probably a few people that got a little bit too excited about Manchester United and Newcastle last season. I don't think they were 
well, at, at least one of them, if Liverpool had just had an average season, wouldn't have been you know as, as high up in the, the standings as what they are. Um, Arsenal as well, I think you know they, they obviously did well, but it felt to me last season in kind of March April time that was their chance to win the league. Really, I think you knew that Liverpool had had an off season. Manchester City maybe had looked a bit more at the Champions League and, and maybe had other priorities. I think last season was was the one really. I think they will be up there and that they'll be a, a, a top four team again, but. I don't know quite whether they're at that level. So, for me, it always it always looks strange. You look at those pundit predictions, and I don't know. I don't know quite how short term some of those mm. sort of things are. I think it's quite it's quite easy to have anticipated that Liverpool would have been a lot better because they. I can't remember what the gap was in the end, but it wasn't many points to fourth position. Yeah. Um, and as I mentioned before, we knew that there was probably five or six players minimum in that starting eleven that were going to be considerably considerably better this season compared to last so yeah I, I don't know how to to explain it really but it's it just feels like when Liverpool have a poor season people overreact too much and when maybe one or two other clubs have a probably just above average season mm. compared to what you'd expect people maybe get a little bit too excited too soon yeah I think you know I mean just to look at last season table first of all um four points is the gap between Newcastle and Liverpool at the end even though Liverpool lost nine games, you know, failed to win half their matches overall. Um, so it's like you say, Matt, you know, there wasn't too much in it when you consider how poor Liverpool were, really. Um, and on kind of the whole of the dog thing, I think it's much easier to play with. I mean, you can look at it in a couple of ways. You can say they don't have, they don't feel that necessarily that pressure. Because I remember, you know, those games probably in sort of 18, 19 is probably the best example when Liverpool were sort of right there at the front and they felt like the hunted really, yeah. at the top of the table. And I think the team did struggle with that a little bit at that time. Even last season, I think, when you think of the first game against Fulham, they drew that game and that felt like, oh, well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was yeah. game one. It was and, game over. Yeah. Because, obviously, it's been sort of one point so many times um, at, at the top of the table and the margins have always been so fine. But, um, so, you know, you can look at it and say they don't have, have play without that pressure um, and they're not necessarily, you know, the hunted anymore. And I think it's always, you know, better to be in the role of, hun of hunter rather than hunted. But, you could also say that there's a bit of a, a chip on your shoulder, really. I think a lot of players feel like they've got a, a point to prove yeah. after last season. I know it's a cliche, but you know, you look at players like Van Dyke, Trent Alexander Arnold, etc., you know, they regard themselves as, as the very best in their position. They need to reassert that. We spoke about that a little bit last week, obviously, um, in the form of Virgil Van Dyke. So I think it's sort of twofold and you'd much rather be underestimated than overestimated. Um last season it was probably a case of um the latter, unfortunately, but I do think that Liverpool will sort of relish this role of kind of, even now, just if you said to Liverpool, you know, you'd be in this position come almost March time and the table look pretty similar in terms of like the gap to, to Arsenal and Man City or at least, you know, them being pretty much within sight. I think they'd take that. they like to almost sort of lurk there behind those two teams and then as long as they can stay in the picture, you know, they'll back themselves, I think, to, um, to prevail in the end. But if we're talking about like what's going to be needed to win the title this year, I mean, Again, it's, it's interesting to have this conversation because I didn't necessarily expect Liverpool to, to be factoring in it. Um, but I think, you know, 23 points out of 30, you've got to take Liverpool seriously on yeah. the back of that, especially with the difficulty of their fixtures. Do you think that the standard in terms of winning it will have to drop for Liverpool to, to take it this year in terms of where they're currently at? Because on average, since Pep Guardiola won his first Premier League, you've needed 94 points to win the title. Is this Liverpool side capable of getting to that level or will it need to be sort of more like mid-80s maybe? It's a hard one to tell. I think it's probably not going to be massively short of that if they can maybe get one more in January and, and get a bit of a similar boost to what they had with with Diaz or with Gakpo um, and bring somebody in, probably probably a midfielder would probably be the obvious one to, to, to come in and, and maybe, maybe elevate that area of the pitch if they can find that right player. But I suppose it might need to drop a little bit, but I... I suspect it might just because the rest of, of the league, you know, you look at where Aston Villa are, they've, I mean, Liverpool made a light work of them and, and made them yeah. look at an average side, but I think they're only a couple of points behind Liverpool. They're, mm. they're right up there. They've had some really impressive results. I think Brighton are still still going to be up there and, and challenging. There's, there's a lot of good teams. You'd expect even, you know, Chelsea, you know, last season finished so far down. You'd expect at some point that they're going to improve, mm. I think. The quality of the league is is such now that there will be there'll be quite a lot of matches I think where 
you'll look at Arsenal and Manchester City and think they might drop points. They won't necessarily. I think City, particularly more often than not, you might have a little bit of a, a glimmer of hope and then they extinguish it pretty easily. But I think there will be there'll be games this season where it's it's a little bit tricky. I think if if Liverpool still had to play Aston Villa home and away, I'd be thinking that might be a potential one where they might might drop points. But as we've seen, they've they've obviously beaten them fairly comfortably. So I think there's there's enough good teams in there to think that you know that there'll be tricky games for the other teams who could potentially contend for the title. Obviously, those tricky games are there for Liverpool as well. But yeah. um, I don't think necessarily there will be a case of you know Liverpool went what was it twenty seven wins and, and a draw in the first twenty eight in in the season that they won the league. Yeah, I don't think anybody's going on a run like that. I think it's. Um, it is it is trickier and it's a lot more tightly congested. I think certainly in the top half. I think the bottom half maybe is is a yeah. little bit different, but in the top half, there's there's probably a case for saying that pretty much every fixture, either team could go into it with a, a realistic chance of thinking there's there's a way that we can win this, which I don't think has has always been the case. Yeah, I think what you touched on there at the end in terms of the bottom half or at least the bottom portion of the table, I'd probably say sort of looking at it here. From about Wolves downwards. I mean, Wolves obviously beat Man City, so maybe Crystal Palace downwards. I think is maybe a little bit weaker. I mean, there's yeah. a, there's a few teams in there. I mean, obviously the promoted sides are quite weak this year. Um, maybe not the best idea to say that before going away to Luton the weekend, <laughs> but um, you know they, they look obviously one of the weaker you know batches of promoted teams. And then there's probably a few teams above them. You know the likes of Fulham, Nottingham Forest, potentially Bournemouth as well, maybe even Everton, where. They're kind of fortunate that those teams are where yeah. they are because otherwise, in a different season, they might kind of be getting relegated. So that isn't isn't necessarily ideal in terms of making the league all that competitive. But I think what you have really, and sort of the point you were touching on, is kind of this block in the middle of the table where, you know, Newcastle, Brighton, West Ham, Brentford, you know, they're all really you know strong opponents, and um, they are capable of taking points off the biggest teams. I mean, if you look. Even just the games coming up for Arsenal and Man City, I just looked it up there while you were talking, Matt. You know, Arsenal, before the end of November, I've got to go to Newcastle and to Brentford, um, Manchester City as well. I've got Chelsea uh, before the international break and then at the start of December, they play Tottenham and they go to Aston Villa. So you are right, you know, I think given the amount of money there is in the league, you'd think that eventually there will be kind of a little bit more regression from those top sides away from that sort of 94-point level. But equally, those teams are so kind of strong in their squads that you don't really know which of those two things is going to win out in the end but if we start to look at kind of the contenders individually then we'll just kind of have a brief look at each of them we do have to talk about about Tottenham and I don't think anyone expected to be talking about Tottenham but 26 points of a possible 30 the best start a new manager's ever made they've not actually been particularly prolific I mean obviously Kay left in the summer they only scored 22 goals in 10 games um, slightly overperforming when it comes to the sort of expected goals there. The justice table, as it's called, based on expected goals for and against, has them fifth at the moment. Now, obviously, four places down and where they currently are. So, do we think that it's an inevitability that Spurs will fall away? Because I'm, I'm sat here and thinking to myself, I feel like we're having the same conversations we were having about Arsenal last year, and we thought, oh, well, Arsenal don't have the, the, you know, the stomach to, to stay with it, and and they did really until right at the very end. But you know, I'm. I'm torn because no, no sort of logical part of me thinks that Tottenham can be a genuine like factor in, or a genuine contender for this title. But equally, you know, every single game that passes by, they get a little bit closer to demanding to be taken seriously. Really, yeah. I I don't think it's inevitable. I don't think we should ever ever write them off completely. But I would be surprised. I think they've they've definitely got enough to get into the top four. I've been impressed by them, but. You know, if the, the Lewis Diaz VAR thing doesn't happen, Liverpool are top now and mm-hmm. Tottenham are where Liverpool are because I think Liverpool probably would go on and, and win that game, even with 10 men. Um, I, I do do believe that Liverpool showed in that game that they are a level above what Tottenham are. Yeah. I think so far there's not been a you know Tottenham missing Harry Kane conversation, but what happens if Son Hyung Min is, is out for a month? Yeah. Suddenly you're looking at that and thinking, well, that's a lot of... A lot of onus on James Madison to suddenly start start scoring goals at a rate yeah. that he's, he's probably never done before. You know, Richarlison is is there, but I'm not massively convinced by him that there's there's not loads of goals in that Tottenham team. I think it, it would be fair to say, and I think they've probably had a reasonable run. Um, 
I have had a look at the fixtures that they've got coming up and they're a little bit trickier. You mentioned Manchester City. I think they've got maybe Newcastle and one or two others coming up. They've had they've had a reasonably all right start to the season. I think, yeah. I can't remember exactly what the period is, but it's it's something like from the end of, of this month into into December is is a pretty, pretty difficult run of fixtures. I think probably by Christmas, they're probably fourth or fifth and, and yeah. that's probably where they end up for, for the rest of, of this season, I think. Yeah, just to quickly whiz through the games, Tottenham have got coming up. Chelsea at home, Wolves away, Villa home, City away, West Ham at home, Newcastle at home. So I, I wouldn't say it's sort of the hardest run they'll have all season, but it's definitely a step up. I mean, Spurs have played six of their first 10 games against sides in the bottom eight. Um, they've obviously played Liverpool, Arsenal and Manchester United. Um, you know, drew with Arsenal, which is a good result at the Emirates. You know, there's not yeah. taking away from that. Um, I think watched that game against Man United. They were a bit fortunate there to to, to win two 0 I think they only just beat Sheffield United as well. And yeah. that, that was at home, and it took yeah. two goals in in stoppage time to win. Everton so. around, I think that was, and uh, Brentford away. They've also played, which is probably the only game against kind of you know. And I mentioned that sort of mid table block earlier of those strong sides. They they drew that game. So if it is weaker at the bottom of the table this season, which I think it's probably fair to say it is, then does that kind of mask the true level of the Spurs side? Again, like like you say, Matt, if they come through this next sequence of games, yeah, and they're still roughly there or thereabouts, then I think Liverpool have got to start to think, you know what, we've got to. I mean, you'd like to think that they're not writing them off or anything like that, but they've got to take them especially seriously if they can get to sort of Christmas time and they're still there. Um, but they're you know obviously hugely impressive, um, and and kind of a really just a really good team to watch as well like it's not a team that you necessarily you know pray for their downfall beyond just kind of you know your own allegiance i think they are sort of a, quite a refreshing side to watch especially given what's come in the past i but, mean they they could definitely take points as well off off other yeah. teams at the top you know i know Manchester city don't have the best record against them there's mm. there's some decent players in there i think for, for spurs they'll benefit as well from already being out of the league cup and, and not having european football i think that's that's a massive thing for them but I don't know if you'd have offered any Tottenham fan fourth at the start of the season, they'd have, yeah. absolutely they would have taken that. And I think that's that's probably where I would see their their limitations. Yeah, one thing we haven't mentioned with Spurs just quickly is that obviously they don't have European football. They're not in the Carabao Cup anymore either, so they are literally just one game a week Premier League, um, which helps. I think in terms of you know you mentioned their potential over reliance on some players, yeah, like Son for example. That's obviously going to help to keep him kind of. Um, fresh and hopefully you know manage his load from their standpoint so you know we we saw sort of that with with Arsenal in the past couple of years I mean they were in the Europa League last season obviously but it didn't necessarily demand their you know full strength squad obviously that can help Liverpool as well Um, because Arsenal and Manchester City are the two sides in the Champions League obviously play really strong midweek teams and we will move on to Arsenal now last season for them felt a bit a bit to me kind of like Liverpool's 18-19 campaign and obviously they didn't get remotely near the level in terms of points and they didn't, you know, win the Champions League, which obviously yeah. Liverpool did too. So I'm not necessarily saying they're as good a team, but in terms of the the floor that they were in for the first maybe two thirds of the season, the fact they built up a decent lead over Man City, but then they just sort of fell away yeah. towards the end eventually. Are they now ready in terms of their maturity and their quality as a football team to take that next step and win the league? I'm still not quite convinced by them, I have to say. Um, I think they did some mixed transfer business. I think Declan Rice is, is a brilliant player. Yeah. I think he'll make a huge difference for them. And I think it's probably telling that nobody's really talking about the amount of money that they spent on him. That's kind of just accepted now as as being the, the price. And, and that was, was fair to pay. And, and that's fine. And that's paid off. But I just look at, at Kai Havertz and think, could you not have spent that money on a proper number nine who can score you yeah. enough goals? I, I just don't see... I know Inketia scored a hat trick at the weekend, but you know Inketia, Jesus, Havertz. I just don't see that there's enough goals in that. Yeah. I think nine times out of ten, the team that scores the most goals usually wins the league. I mm -hmm. think I would have Liverpool quite comfortably as being able to score more goals than than Arsenal this season. Yeah. You look at you know the, the quality that Liverpool have got on the depth as well, the the variety of attacking options. I just think that there will be games where Arsenal just need a moment that someone can just pop up from from nowhere. They they need a Diogo Jota to just yeah. score a decisive goal for them or, you know, Mohamed Salah to pop up with a little moment of magic to open up a defence. I, I just think that they're very they're very well set up to to beat the lesser teams and I think they'll do that again and I think they'll comfortably get into the top four. But to take that next step, 
the the one position that I would have looked at in the summer was a number nine. Yeah. And they've gone and, and got one and used him in midfield. And he wasn't particularly good for Chelsea. Mm-hmm. And they've spent a lot of money on him. Um, it, it just doesn't feel it doesn't feel to me like they have addressed the two big needs that they had. One of them that they have obviously with Rice and, and he's a massive, massive upgrade on, on what they had, but yeah. without a number nine that's gonna get you as many goals as a Salah or a Haaland, I, I just don't really see how how Arsenal take that next step. Particularly with Liverpool as the extra competition though. You know, maybe if it was just Arsenal and City again, maybe you could kind of, you know, make you know, maybe you can beat them somehow. But I think with with two teams to, to go for the title alongside them, it just feels like they they were ready to take the next step, but they've kind of missed a bit of an opportunity, I think. I think it's interesting that the conversation around Arsenal is very similar to Manchester City in the season that was played behind closed doors when they basically just played without a striker. And every time they dropped points, it was sort of like, oh, well, they need that clinical number nine. But then they ended up obviously winning the league yeah. quite comfortably. But I think the difference here is that City team had a much bigger gap in terms of quality to everybody, everybody else. Like, yeah. with sort of finer margins are going to make the difference here. And that could be something that potentially costs Arsenal. I mean, the way I, I look at it is the Liverpool team that won the league so emphatically in 1920 had Roberto Firmino up front. He was probably a, a bit of a Gabriel Jesus figure in terms of what he brings and not necessarily being that absolute, you know, incredibly high output number nine. But they had Salah and Mane either side yeah. who were going to be in that golden boot conversation. As good as Saka and Martinelli are, and you're going to be hard-pressed to find a better pair of, of, of wingers, really, in Europe. I don't necessarily see them being those kind of players. So the, I think the question, you know, like you say, Matt, is whether they have sort of that kind of firepower and that ruthlessness. Um, but I do think that they have taken a bit of a, a step forward this season in terms of their readiness and obviously beating Manchester City at yeah. home yeah. is a big yeah, one yeah, for yeah. them. Given that, you know, City have not only kind of owned them as a as an opponent for for years now it was last season when they were going head to head I think they they scored seven goals against Arsenal at the end and only conceded two over the two games so I think that was a huge thing for them and I think like increasingly you look at kind of Arsenal I think they're they're getting the results in the big games I think they've got a bit more resilience about them now so I think that for Liverpool sort of plan plan A or the first objective has to be right let's get ahead of Arsenal first and then obviously yeah. you target Man City as the, as the reigning champions because I don't think it, it's strange at them because I don't I don't get the sense that they've reached their, their complete best level so far this season but you know their, their level on points with City they've already got some some big results yeah. um, and I think that game between Liverpool and Arsenal and Field in, in its time yeah. it's going to be absolutely yeah. huge as well I still think there's a bit of a question mark over the goalkeepers as well. Because yeah, I don't that's, think that's a big one actually. I don't think either of them is is better than the other, but I don't think either of them is at the level that they want to be at. Neither of them is anywhere near Allison or, or Edison's level. Um, I mean, it, it's a level up on the Mignolet Carrius kind of thing at, at Liverpool because they're both better goalkeepers than both of those two. But yeah. it, it's a bit like that for me, where there's no obvious one that's better or. I think they've maybe created a little bit of a problem for themselves in in that. So th- there's a couple of question marks, I think, with Arsenal. Um, but yeah, you're right. I think that game, uh, I think it's the 21st of December or something like that. And yeah. I think that one, that one will tell us a lot. I think if, if Liverpool can win that and then maybe go ahead of Arsenal going into Christmas, that's when you start to have yeah. those conversations of, right, Liverpool are really in a title race now. And those games are going to, obviously, you know, should go without saying, but in terms of, defining who is going to be the likeliest challenger I think it, it just feels like an absolutely pivotal game almost equally as much as uh, as Liverpool play in Manchester City in a way um, which they obviously will do later this month at the Etihad um, and I think the goalkeeper one's an interesting point because it's not only kind of the level of the two players individually it's whether Arteta has created a sort of an unhealthy dynamic by yeah. trying to sort of say oh I can rotate my goalkeepers and not have because Ray is in there and he's been in there for a, a decent stretch now but doesn't feel secure and that yeah. doesn't necessarily lend itself to kind of stability. And also, you think to yourself, I mean, obviously you've got this Leicester season which kind of throws all these sort of golden rules out of whack, but who was the last team who won the Premier League without a genuinely elite goalkeeper? Yeah. You know, aside from that. like the, There was a lot of pressure on, on the goalkeeper last season. I think that yeah. probably didn't help. There was a couple of errors in there that yeah. could have cost them maybe a little bit more than, than what they did. Um I'm not massively. I'm not a massive fan of, of Ramsdale. I think he's he's fine, but he's not. Yeah. He's not an elite goalkeeper. I think he struggled a little bit during the running last season. And you know, if 
whether it's him or, or whether it's Ryer in the running this time, I mean, the pressure is there because of the title, but it's also there because they know if they make a mistake, there's another guy who's pretty much the same level as they are to, to come in and, and, and come into the team. So I, yeah, I, I suspect they've probably made a little bit of an error with that, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, as we kind of go through each team and sort of pick them apart a little bit, obviously if you were a fan of Arsenal or of Tottenham, you'd say, well, yeah, you can say this about us, but equally, you know, where's your kind of specialist defensive midfield? Like each of the teams you've discussed so far, like probably does have sort of that whole like that you can pick at. And it's a question of who's going to be able to sort of manage that the best. And the January window, I think, is going to be important as well. Yeah. You saw that in the 21-22 season, Liverpool getting Diaz. I think Arsenal obviously did a couple of bits last year. Wouldn't surprise me if they targeted a number nine there, if they can get one. And we obviously see what Tottenham do as well, because if you spares it and Daniel Levy, you think there's a genuine chance to win the league, surely you're going to throw a bit of money at that in January. Even um, to just get into the top four, it's, it's worth it, isn't it, for them yeah. to to try and establish themselves? Because again, it's, the, the Tottenham thing is is a bit similar to Arsenal had an opportunity last season to win the league. Yeah, I suspect that Manchester United won't be as bad as, as what they have been mm. this season for forever at some point they're going to come back you've got yeah. you know Villa and, and Brighton who are trying to build Chelsea or another one that are, are going to improve I think if yeah. if you're Tottenham and you're Postacoglu if you don't get in the top four this season it's not going to be any easier for you the following season yeah. by which time you're going to have Europa League potentially if you're not in the Champions League yeah it's a huge opportunity for them and one that they absolutely have to take just to kind of get back in, in that cycle really because it's sort of obviously you get kind of the rewards of being in there and sometimes it can be self perpetuating in any direction if you're if you're in there or you're not but let's finish with Manchester City not only the reigning champion but also the reigning treble holder um, they're currently like I say level on points with Arsenal they've got a pretty rock solid defensive record they've already conceded seven times that's the best in the league and obviously the underlying numbers have them uh, top of the table as well um, in terms of their expected goals for and against so I think the best way to look at it for Man City given that this is probably the, the best team in Premier League history um, just in terms of the statistics really what will it take for them not to win the league because you sort of search I mean we've obviously spoken about it with Arsenal and Spurs you search for a weakness I think the only one to my mind that they've actually showed is the over-reliance on Rodri they lost back-to-back games without him for the first time yeah. in five years is that the only one that, that you would pick out or is there anything else I mean you mentioned a couple of players who left earlier as well yeah I, I think that's definitely a weakness but Rodri isn't a player that tends to pick up that many injuries or yeah. suspensions, I think he'll be there, you know, for, for most of, of these matches. Um I think Ilkay Gundogan is is one that I would look at. I think if they didn't have him in a couple of the, the run ins that they've had with Liverpool, probably yeah. things would have, have ended differently. He's, I think he's he, he's a really underrated player. I'm yeah. surprised that they let him go and and, and obviously I think that will be a loss. I'm not massively convinced by Mateus Nunes or Calvin Phillips hasn't particularly done, you know, a great deal for them. I think he's you know, a decent player to be honest, mm-hmm. but he's he's just not been given an opportunity for for whatever reason. I think there's 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 definitely a case I think for Liverpool having a better squad than Manchester City, particularly in forward areas. Um, I, I think obviously they've got Haaland and, and Alvarez, but. Doc, who is, has done well so far, he's probably better than than what I thought he was going to be in terms of his his kind of final ball and, and final product in the final third. But I look, there's not loads in it, but I, I think there's there's definitely an argument to be made that Liverpool looks like a more complete squad. Um, that's not to say that the the most complete squad will go on and win the league because yeah. if you've got Haaland, then you can just win every game and he'll just score three goals every game and and, and that'll be that. But I. I don't know. There's not a great deal in it, but I, I do, I do think there's a genuine case to be made for for Liverpool being being slightly, slightly ahead of them in terms of the depth and the numbers that they've got. I, I do think you know Manchester City in, in previous seasons, you know last season they won the treble and and didn't necessarily have an enormous squad, but yeah, um, it, it wouldn't take that many injuries for them to suddenly look short. The question is, you know, the the key players, Rodri. Harland, you know, they, they don't tend to miss many games, so it, it usually doesn't matter. One thing you'd probably say if you're a City fan as well is, you know, we're here, we're, we're two points off the, the top of level with Arsenal, and we've you know, had Kevin De Bruyne for yeah. virtually, yeah. you know, the whole season so far, um, which is, you know, he's arguably the best player in the Premier League. So I think it's interesting that you mentioned the City squad. It kind of feels like things have, have changed more than they normally do at City over the course of a summer. Like, there's been sort of that sense of, of like 
evolution in previous seasons, whereas now it feels like a bit more sort of upheaval because obviously we've seen, you know, Bardiol, Nunez, Doku, Kovacic have come in, but also, you know, loads of kind of key players have left, like Mares, Laporte, Gundogan have left. You know, Cancelo was obviously a bit of a factor in previous teams that they had as well. Um, so it feels like a slightly different version of the City side and whether they've kind of lost a couple of, of their big game players within that. I think obviously Gundogan is a, a very good example of that. And I, I kind of wondered at the start of the season whether sort of winning that treble last year, especially getting that Champions League, does that kind of... Are you able to kind of summon the same level of, of motivation yeah. really after that? And I think it's not necessarily a tangible thing. And a lot of the time we say this, like, oh, are they going to want it as much? And, and then they just do. And, and they've got the quality anyway where it doesn't really matter. But part of me thinks, you know, maybe it was an accusation that was double season after Liverpool went and won the Premier League because it was a thing that they they chased for so long. And maybe their kind of desire wasn't quite there compared to someone like an Arsenal, for example, where basically none of those players have tasted that kind of success before. Um, so whether that will play into it, I don't know. And again, it might just be wishful thinking. But do you think from a psychological standpoint, it's something that's worth mentioning at least? I think Guardiola has kind of hinted a little bit at that as well. Um, and the upheaval can work in two ways, can't it? It can be that they've lost Gundogan and they don't score that decisive goal in the last game of the season that they need to win the league. Or it could be that they've got fresh players in there now and the, the complacency probably isn't there for, you know, Doku is, is new and, and hasn't won the league before. Uh, Mateus Nunes has just got his opportunity at a big club and, and yeah. can work with Guardiola. There's there's enough there's enough fresh faces within that team that you think they've probably done what Liverpool probably should have done, um, you know, two, three seasons ago where they've won, reached that pinnacle and then yeah. stuck with the same team. Maybe if they'd have changed it a little bit more, that, that could have maybe been been sustained. Obviously, it's a lot easier when you've got the money that Manchester City have got and you can just go, yeah, we'll we'll pay 55 million for, for Mateus Nunes, no yeah. problem. Um, but I do think that, that Gundogan will be a big loss, but mm-hmm. there is something to say for, for freshening it up and, and moving a few players on, as we've seen, to be fair, with Liverpool yeah. this season as well. Flip side of that coin, obviously, but I think the thing with City that also has to be mentioned is that I think Liverpool are probably the closest in terms of doing this, but they have this unique ability to find another gear in yeah. our running. Yeah. I had a look at, over the last three genuine title races, the games that actually were meaningful from sort of the, the spring onwards to the start of March. 32 games played, 29 wins, three draws, zero losses. I mean, it's an absolutely ridiculous record. And the question is, you know, can any if they do that again, can anyone live with them? Does, yeah. does someone necessarily need to, to build up a lead and then hold on to it under the pressure from City, yeah. or can someone actually go strive for stride them in that run? And if they can reach that level, obviously it is a bit of a an if, you know, because it, it is sort of robotic form, and you know the team has changed a little bit. But that is arguably City's biggest weapon is how well they've done in the run-ins over the years. But um, just to finish then, Matt, I mean one last thing to touch on. We've obviously touched on four teams here when you include Liverpool. I think we, at this stage, you probably consider three of those serious contenders, obviously minus Tottenham. I think the last time that there was genuinely three teams in the race was probably the year Leicester won it, and it was Leicester, Arsenal and Spurs who all believed that they had an opportunity to win it. Could that be exactly what Liverpool need to have that kind of extra team in the race? Because when they've previously gone up, gone up against City, it's been them, and there's been sort of a, at least a 10-point gap to kind of the teams behind does it feel like if it's a little bit more competitive at the top that actually suits Liverpool, especially if they're not going to be able to kind of reach that sort of absolutely you know, mid nineties point standard? Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that Arsenal have beaten Manchester City probably plays into that and, and helps. I think you are going to need to have a couple of other teams take points off Manchester City in those big games and yeah. and put them under pressure and almost just give teams a bit of a feeling that they can be beaten I think that can be an issue at certain times like you mentioned the record there like probably most teams within that 32 game period were just going into it thinking let's just get out of this and, and lose by two and not yeah. get absolutely hammered and, and that'll be that'll be fine um, I think that definitely can, can help Liverpool I think I definitely think Liverpool need to get into the lead by January or so if they're going to have a genuine opportunity I think if Arsenal or City start to, to get away, it, it can quickly unravel quite you know quite easily, and, and it can become a, a top four race again. I think probably for me, for, for Liverpool to have a genuine chance of, of winning the league, they've got to carry on doing what they're doing against the lesser teams. 
they've got to get something against Manchester City at the Etihad, yeah. and they've probably got to beat Arsenal at Anfield as well mm. in the first half of, of the season. Yeah. Obviously, then you've got the, the reverse of, of those games in the second half to come. But I think they've got to they've got to get down, you know, ideally more than than a couple of points. But if they can get a couple of points ahead by by Christmas, I think that's that's probably the the, the route home where you start to think that there's a genuine belief there. I think if if Liverpool are, are third, fourth by that time, I think it becomes a little bit more difficult to, to see that argument. But I think I think there will be three teams in the race, but I think Manchester City are overwhelming favourites. And if it isn't Manchester City, I think it'll be Liverpool. I don't think it'll be Arsenal. Yeah, and um, like you say, obviously there's a couple of, before the end of this year, there's a couple of really big games coming up from that standpoint and we'll see kind of how Liverpool emerge from that. And just feel like a little bit of a cliche, but you get the sense that Liverpool can't win the league at any point sort of before May especially when you look at that form from City they can certainly they have plenty of opportunities to lose it before then yeah. and I think you're absolutely spot on in terms of I mean I maybe knock Tottenham a little bit for the quality of opponents they play but there's you know there's a lot to be said for just kind of you know being almost automatic in those games and sweeping up the points because I mean the reality just on the numbers alone is that you're going to play a lot more of those teams and you're going to play sort of Man City and Arsenal and things like that so that that was the reason that was the reason to be fair that I thought Liverpool would be considerably better than they were last season because the teams that they tended to struggle the most against and, and look the worst against yeah. last season were the teams that you think it's it's a relatively easy fix for example as yeah. we saw against Nottingham Forest this time it was complete domination it was it wasn't easy for them but they basically yeah. just snuffed out anything that Forrest tried to do was was gone mm. last season that game was 3-2 you know they got beat 1-0 away um, it, it was a completely completely different Liverpool team so I think it'll be relatively close I think Liverpool will be will be in that race but it's it, it's early-ish days but you know, even the sample size to, to go right back to what you said at the start you know it's it's 10 games in but how many of those 10 games have Liverpool actually had 11 players on the pitch yeah, I think yeah. that probably plays into it as well there's, there's been certain you know, defeat the the defeat at Spurs, for example. I know we keep coming back to it, and I, I'm not going to let that go. But they finished that game with nine players and, and still only just lose. I yeah. think that that says to me more than anything that if you can go down to nine men and only lose by a late own goal to Spurs, that says a lot about Spurs. But it also says probably a lot about Liverpool as well. I think. Yeah, and it's not just obviously the the quality of the squad in those moments. It's also the feature of this team when it's won the biggest trophies has been the mentality as well and to see that return I mean obviously we've not really kind of touched on that yet but to see that kind of come back is obviously going to be a crucial factor especially when the standard even if there are you know more than one team in the picture this year in addition to Liverpool standard is obviously so high but yeah I think we'll leave it there for today's episode remember to check out uh, last week's as well we took a deep dive into Virgil van Dijk and that's very much still relevant because he was excellent as well against Nottingham Forest at the weekend so we had kind of a look at where he sort of stands at the moment in in the global picture for centre-backs and kind of looking ahead make sure you're following all the written content at liverpool.com and obviously the video content on the Bud Red channel leading up to the game against Luton this weekend we'll be back next week with another episode so we will see you then